coming up on Garden Talk. The scrog technique means utilizing and maximizing my light and the space of my grow area. I like to use masonry twine too because it does sometimes have that wax coating and it's tough and it's nice and thin. So those are the three that I use to string up the actual frame. They're going to get bigger right at your screen level, which you don't really want because they're not optic full as the light. So there's going to be a lot of little node sites that you want to defoliate in your flower defoliation. So I want to tuck sooner. So that means that my hole sizing is going to be a little bit smaller so I can tuck sooner. You're definitely going to probably yield a bit more scrogging than you would typically off a normal kind of plant, but only because you're going to be growing top dense colas on your screen and every bud you have is going to be a top cola that has density to it. What's up everybody? If you that don't know me, my name is Chris, aka Mr. Grow It, and you're tuned into the Garden Talk Podcast. This episode number 86. In this episode, I interview Northern Scrogger. He has been gardening for 20 years and is well known for being a scrogger. And that's what we're going to get into in today's episode. He talks all about how he does the scrog technique in detail. Thanks to all of you who support this podcast through Patreon. If you'd like to support, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash mrgrowit. Before we get into it, I want to acknowledge that one of my goals for this podcast is to bring zero cost for information about gardening, all plants, to the general public. That being said, I'd like to thank the sponsors of today's episode who helped make that goal possible. Spider Farmer is sponsoring this episode. Spider Farmer is doing a big sale for Amazon Prime Days this month, October 11th and October 12th. All Spider Farmer products in their Amazon store will be discounted, and you can use my discount code MrGrowIt5 for an additional percent off. They have LED grow lights, grow tents, grow tent kits, ventilation systems, and more. Search for Spider Farmer on Amazon, and don't forget to use the discount code MrGrowIt5 for a discount on their products. AC Infinity is sponsoring this episode. Their clip-on oscillating fan is now released. I've been using their 6-inch version for over 6 months now, and I absolutely love it. It's easy to clip on the side of my grow tent, and it has 10 different speeds which makes it easy to control air circulation. They do also have non-oscillating versions of these clip-on fans. These fans are currently in high demand. When they sell out of the fans, which I expect them to often, you can pre-order them for the next release. You can also use discount code MrGrowIt if you're buying off their website, acinfinity.com. That discount code works for all AC Infinity items. Or discount code MrGrowIt15 if you're buying off Amazon. And we are back. Welcome to the Garden Talk podcast. Today I am joined with Troy, also known as Northern Scrogger. How are you doing today? Good. How are you, Chris? Thank you so much for uh, having me here, man. I'm doing good. Thanks for asking. Yeah, I'm glad you decided to come on. You actually reached out to me first, although I had many people reach out to me and request that you come on. They've seen what you're doing over on your YouTube channel and Instagram and just really blown away at what you do in the garden. And that's kind of what we're going to get into today is your style of plant training. More more particular, what you're well known for is the scrog technique. We're going to really get deep into it. And what I mean by that is I want to get into the nitty gritty details of it. So we'll ask uh, some of those deep detail oriented questions so people can um, learn your technique and potentially implement it in their garden. Perfect. I'm excited to talk about it. But I just want to first say um, I appreciate that everything that you do for our community, Chris. Um, I've actually watched your videos on YouTube quite, like quite a few years ago. I learned a lot from you, man. And um, just from all your little garden talk shows, I watch them and I learn a lot. So I just, I just want to say thank you to me or from me and a lot of people that probably don't get to do this and talk to you and say thank you like this. So I appreciate what you do, first of all. And yeah, let's do this. I'm ready now. Uh, thanks for your positive words. Yeah, it's, it's positive words like that, positive feedback that really are fuel for us content creators to keep going, right? If we have people that are gaining value from our content, we're going to keep spending our time making the content. So thanks for uh, your positive words. No worries. You deserve it. How about an introduction? Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into gardening? Yeah, for sure. Well, um, what happened to me was I was introduced at a very young age. Uh, my family actually used it, so I got I grew up like knowing it, seeing it a lot. Um, so when I was actually younger, probably about eight years old, maybe ten years old, I followed my parents out to the garage where I wasn't supposed to go, 
and I stumbled into like a kind of a grow up, just like well, like what you see back here. It was just a white plastic sheets, and I opened up the plastic sheets, and I saw a few a few medicinal plants sitting there, and, and like that just kind of at first it was shocking, but it was really kind of cool to see, right? So um, since then. As I grew up in life, I became wanting interested in, in this. And uh, my mom started showing me a few little tips when I was younger about how to grow this product. And uh, and she was a scrogger, kind of cool, right? So my mom taught me how to scrog. As I got older, I threw a few little of my own tips into it. And uh, and things just took off from there. I just kept on scrogging ever since then. I don't really grow anything else uh, naturally, I'm, I'm a Scrogger, so yeah, that's just, I just call myself Brother and Scrogger because I live in Canada, and uh, in a little bit of the northern region of Canada, I'm not quite north of Canada, but we call ourselves Northern Canada, so I call myself Northern Scrogger. That's so cool, and now you have a YouTube channel, you have a pretty big following over there, and Instagram, how'd you get into wanting to produce content? Well, yeah, that's, that's pretty neat. What happened to me was, during our covid when COVID first came out, everyone kind of got laid off from their jobs, and I was one of them. Uh, but I always had a scrog going. I, I was always a scrogger. So that's when I was like, you know what? I'm going to start showing my scrogs on Facebook groups. I'm just going to show my scrogs, and I'm going to add a little tip to help people learn how to scrog. And so I did that well, uh, one tip, and that one tip kind of blew up, and a lot of people liked it, and a lot of people asked me for more. So like a week later, I, I took another picture of my grow, and I was like, this is another tip. This is when you should tuck. And... And like I added that tip and that kind of blew up. And then people started telling me like, you should make a, your own group on Facebook, your own group. So then I created my own group called Scroggers, which is my hat here. And that's on Facebook. Um, and then, and then I got told by people to make an Instagram. So I, I created an Instagram called Northern Scrogger. And since then that, that got deleted and I have a new one called the Northern Scrogger on Instagram. But, but really what happened was the initial Facebook reactions was got me thinking like, wow, I could really help a lot of people in this technique and uh, I should just keep pushing and, and try to become good at it, good at creating content to help help new growers and help even experienced growers if they want to learn how to scrog. That's awesome. That's really, really cool. So are you just an indoor grower or you also do outdoors? Are you organic or synthetic? Are you in soil, cocoa, hydro? Yeah, I used to, uh, I used to do outdoor grows, but um, once it became legalized more so in Canada. I got right into the indoor grows like steadily. Um, I like the indoor grows more because I can control my environment. The outdoor grows, I always like you do good, but I feel like later on in the season that the environment changes. Sometimes it's too too humid for the for the, for the like what the plant needs. Stay late in flower, and you're up like high humidity, and it's pouring rain every day. Like I, I just got sick of outdoor growing, so I just took it right to the indoor. And I am a synthetic grower. Um, right now I use future harvest nutrients for all my satanic growing and uh, I want to learn how to organic grow I just I just don't like the bug aspect of it like sometimes there's a lot of bugs with organic growing I know some bugs are good bugs but I just I'm just not there yet with wine bugs being in my space I just like uh, I'm just I'm good with satanic right now and I honestly feel that plants don't tell the difference from like organic to satanic so I know there's a lot of difference in like all the bottles you have on the time it takes to mix the nutrients. Like I get that part of it, and that is a that's a huge deal. It's time saving right there. So there's so many pawns, there are pros and cons to each, but I, I do gotta get into it and just try it and, and like expand my knowledge. That makes sense. Yeah, outdoors in particular, it's a whole different battlefield, right? Now, luckily, you know, the plant that we're growing that we all know and love is uh, very resilient and it's going to be able to adapt. But yeah, it's it, it has its own unique challenges, indoor versus outdoor and organic versus synthetic and, and all that stuff. But definitely like to hear about you know what the guest's growth style is because uh, yeah, it can definitely help lead the conversation. And I guess to start, Really basic question. I do have beginners that tune into this podcast as well. So when we say scrog, what is the scrog technique? In my mind, well, in a lot of people's mind, they, the scrog technique is called like the screen of green. So this screen behind me would be just full of colas eventually. Um, but really, in my mind, the scrog technique means utilizing and maximizing my light and the space of my grow area. So I'll build my screen the size of my grow space that will work my light. So if I have a five by five flowering footprint light, I'll build a five by five screen and I'll maximize that screen by filling it full of colas as much as possible. 
and then I'll maximize my light to feed all of these colas at the same height as each other with a full canopy. Uh, so really, that, that's that's what scrawling is in my mind, is maximizing my light and my space. Okay, and then you answer my next question, which is what size net do you use? You just mentioned if you're in a 5x5 five five space, that net size is going to be 5 feet by 5 feet. Same thing with the smaller spaces, I assume, that you grow in. You have the lights coverage area will be the size of the net. Is that correct? Yeah, that's that's what you want to aim for. But if you have a screen that's like, say, 4x4 four four screen, so you're only going to have 4x4, four four 10, I can still use lights that are capable of a 5x5 five five space in a 4x4 four four 10. You just don't have to have it like turned up all the way or dialed up all the way. So so yeah, like that goes with each other. Um, I just definitely wouldn't build a screen much bigger than 5x5 five because five, most of our lights that we use these days are a 5x5 five five footprint. Uh, you, you can't buy much more than that right now with the LED world. So um, that's that's pretty much like yeah, you just gotta you just kind of gotta not use your head, but just think about your footprint of your light and the size of the screen that you want to build. That's that's the main. That's that's really like what it is. That makes sense. And then in these nets, right? Trellis net is often used. There are different size trellis nets as far as like the holes. What size holes do you go for? I mean, I think there's three inches. I think it's four inches. There might be some other sizes as well. But like, what size holes do you prefer in your net? Yeah, in my net, see, I don't buy a trellis net. I build my own screen. Um, so what I do is I build my own screens anywhere from 2.5 inches to 3.5 inches. And why I do that is because if I go any smaller than 2.5 inches, then Sometimes when your plants grow, the node spacing gets tight. And if you have a two inch hole space, then your nodes will get trapped. And as your plant gets more into flower, those node spaces become buds and that's when they get fat and they extend. And if, if they're all stuck underneath a screen that's only has two inch hole spacing, you're gonna get problems like PM and mildew and, and no air movement basically because you're, you're growing a real tight carpet. So I like to use like say 2.5 to 3.5 because now I can like, have space for each node to grow up through a separate hole on my screen. It's easier to tuck when your holes are a little bit smaller compared to say a four inch hole size. Because if you have four inch hole size, then you gotta wait for your branch to grow up at least four inches before you can tuck it underneath again. I don't really want my branches to grow four inches because by that time, they are gonna get a little bit thicker. They are gonna develop more. Their node sites are gonna start thinking like they're on a vertical growth path instead of being on a horizontal that I horizontal that I want. So I wanna tuck sooner. So that means that my hole sizing is gonna be a little bit smaller so I can tuck sooner. So also why I, I tie my own strings on my scrog frames is, is for harvesting purposes. I like to cut my string when I harvest. And if I was to buy them every time, they're, they're not cheap. Well, they are relatively cheap, but not cheap in, in, in a way, right? People want to kind of wrestle their screen off so they can save that screen for the next run. What I do is it's cheap, so I'll just cut down two sides of my frame, and then I just pull the twine out. It, it just slides right out perfectly. Whatever I use just slides right out, and the plant doesn't just fall down. It kind of just, it kind of just like mushrooms and, and just sits there ready for me to chop it at the base. So... So yeah, I kind of went in a little bit detail there, but yeah, the, the screen hole sizing is, is just like 2.5, 3.5. That's my preference and that's what I would use. And I, I build my own and I have videos on YouTube on how to build your own and it's really, really easy and it takes 10 minutes to string one of these frames up once you have the frame built. Understood. Yeah. Thanks for explaining the pros and cons for the different sizes. I wasn't, you know, I, some of these things you don't think of. Like another reason why I like to string my own scrogs, strings or screens up is because when I tuck a branch, I can actually grab the, twi the twine that I use and I can slide it with my fingers a little bit and I can tuck that branch under, slide the twine and then I'll hold the branch with like one of the, one of the fan leaves will hold that twine and I can let go and it will sit there. If you buy, if you buy store-bought twine, you can't slide that position it at all it, it's it's there like you can't move it over you can't slide it this way so that's that's another good tip right there is like i do move my screen around sometimes to pull it closer when i talk so i got i can make it reach that's a good tip right there i want to throw in that's a good call out so using twine that you purchased i assume from a local store or online can you talk to us about like the actual building of the frame by using pvc what size pvc how, how are you actually affixing the twine to the PVC, so on and so forth. Can you talk about like the build of it? Yeah. 
So what I do is I use three quarter inch PVC, and then and then I buy uh, these little tees that are called three way tees. But what I advise new growers is to buy four way PVC tees. That just gives you another extension on the top if you ever need a second trellis. Okay, so what I do is I build these screens three quarter inch PVC, and then whatever I want my hole sizing to be is I run screws down the top of my screen three inches that right now all my screens are three inch hole spacing so every three inches i'll put a black mark and then i just get tap tap drilling screws and i just screw in every black mark that takes it probably takes me like to build a five by five screen it'll probably take a good like one hour it takes some time but you have it forever and when you're not using this frame i can just take it all apart into pieces and I can I can like wrap it up in tape in a nice little neat little bundle and I can store it somewhere for when I want to start over again I just pull it out put it all together do my twine again which takes a few minutes and then I'm ready to rock so I like to use twine I like to use masonry rope and I like to use hemp twine but there's a difference between a lot of them if you're gonna use a twine you want to try to get a wax coated twine because the hairs fray off it and you'll have a bunch of like fraying hairs on your, on like when you take pictures you see a bunch of hairs on your twine exposed. If you use hemp twine, it also frays. So you have a bunch of hair exposed, like fraying hairs off the twine. Um, but hemp twine is not bad because it's biodegradable and you can actually probably even smoke a little bit of it if it gets caught in there. Um, I, I like to use masonry twine too because it does sometimes have that wax coating and it's tough and it's nice and thin. So. Those are the three that I use to string up the to string up the actual frame. That's good to know. Good good information there. Now, how many plants are you doing underneath the net? There, are you doing a, a a plant per square foot, or like how do you go about it? Yeah, so I like to do one. I like to have at least two by like two feet by two feet square feet for one plant. So if I'm like doing a five by five straw, I'll probably grow like four plants under it. Um, if I'm doing like a like a like a two by two scrog frame because there is two you can grow one plant under a nice two by two frame and one plant it, it works perfect or if i had a four by four frame i'd probably do like two or maybe three plants so i just like to keep like the, yeah like two foot area kind of for one plant at least because i do veg for only like i know people think i veg for a long time but i really do only veg for two months from a seedling so really, it takes a seedling to take off. It takes out about three weeks just for a seedling to really start to take off, right? That's three weeks right there. And then I'm then I'm talking underneath the screen for like a month and a little bit. And then I'm flipping. Oh, got it. That makes sense. And what would you say the measurement is between the top of the grow pot and the screen? Yeah, that's another good question. What I what I this is just what I do. I'm just going to tell you things that I do. So the way that the way that I scrog is I like to keep my screens six to eight inches off the top of my pot. I don't go any more than eight and I really don't even go eight anymore. I just recommend that is the maximum height. And I only say eight inches for like the elderly people, for people that like have to really get under there and work on their plants, have really big arms. You want a little bit more space under there. But I like to go six inches, that's my spot. So I like to keep my screen low as possible because that's gonna shorten my veg time. Got it. Yeah, I've actually heard as high as 18 inches from the top of the pot. Six inches is actually the lowest I've heard, but it, it makes sense, you know, because exactly what you just said, it, you can reduce the amount of veg time you have, your your real squat to the actual net. And uh, yeah, that's, that's that's good to know. Yeah, I can, I can go into a little bit of that if you want me to, a little bit why I keep my screens low. Yeah, sure. And actually another question would be, when do you start the training? Are you just bending branches down? Or are you doing any topping first or fimming first and then starting to get into the screen or what? Yeah, so good. What I do is um, first I have my cups in, or my plants in like a solo cup. I wait about two weeks, two weeks and a couple of days-ish. I put them in my five-gallon pot. And then I'm going to let them be in that five-gallon pot for like maybe one or, day twos, one or two days just to like kind of recuperate from a transplant right just give them a couple days as soon as that plant is like enough for me to start tying on to i'm going to start training it i might not top it right away i'm i'm first i'm going to bend it over i'm going to put a little tie on its bottom stock and keep the keep the main stem coming from my soil keep that straight then i'm going to tie off the top and i'm going to i'm going to bend the top as i 
as I keep the the main stem firm and straight. Because a lot of people, a lot of people miss that step. They just tie from the top, then their whole plant comes on a lean. Now you're like ripping the roots around. You don't see it, but you're really like hurting the bottom of the plant there. So like you really want to tie off this bottom of your plant and then tie down. And then yeah, and then after I do after I do that, I will keep on training that plant all the individual branches that start growing up i'll tie them to the sides of my pot i'll do that for the first month of the plant's growth so even from seedling right for the first month i'm just tying down the branches once i transplant it and then after one month i put my screens on and i, I get my plants all ready for the screen and i and i untie all the branches from the pot and i let the plant just kind of push up into the screen and then I continue tucking it for another month. So that this is where I keep my screens low because my screen is only six inches off the top of the pot. So that happen, the plant will reach that six inches real fast. Usually within a month of growth, it's up six inches high. That now I'm not, I'm not waiting for it to be 18 inches high. I'm using every node on that plant. Even the first node on that plant that most people trim off in defoliation, they trim off the first few nodes so they can expose the top of their plant. Well, I'm using every node on my plant. So I'll start training every node all around my branch, all around my screen for another month. And then that's when I will flip the flower. I always flip the flower on two months, no matter what, because I figured out from struggling for a long time and the size of screens that I use, what we just talked about, how much I have for per plant, two feet by two feet per plant. I know that in two months, it's, it's pretty much time for me to flip. And I'm going to continue tucking for that first two weeks of me flipping the flower. So during the flower stretch, I'm still tucking my branches underneath my screen. That's, that's one of my main tips of scrogging is keep on tucking during the flowering stretch. Now, are you waiting to flip to flower until every single one of those squares is full? Or are you like 95% full and then you do the flip to flower or what? No, what I do is... I just, I flip, I flip at no matter what at two months, but I have, um, like I, I've, I figured out that like it only takes two months to fill that size of the screen that I use. If, if I had a big, big screen with one plant, I could, yeah, veg for longer and try to fill more of the screen up, but you don't run, you don't want to run out of space on your screens. Cause if you run out of space on your screen, then you're going to have runoff branches that are taller than other branches on your screen. And now you're not maximizing your light anymore because you got to work your light to the top of that runoff branch. You can't work it on the whole canopy anymore. So I, I, I try to have a little bit of space on my screen still. When I'm, when I'm about to harvest, I want to see the edges still exposed because I, like, I don't aim to fill my screen and I don't aim for yield. I aim for quality. I'm, I'm here for quality over quantity. So that's why I do the two month veg. Um, to fill up each hole in the screen is actually really easy. You're probably going to have two, two bud sites per hole, the way that I scrog. So it, it gets, it gets really, it gets really packed in a certain way. Like not, but that's why you want to have the three inch hole spacing. Cause if you don't have the three inch hole spacing or three and a half, you're not going to fit two nodes, two bud sites in that hole. It, it's just going to get too cramped with two of them, right? So yeah, that's why I say three to the three to four inch or three to, or sorry, 2.5, 3.5 inch hole size on your screens. You mentioned some branches coming up and, and kind of outgrowing some of the other branches in the net. How do you manage that? Is there things that you can do in order to kind of control the height? Like I know some people do a super cropping, for example. So they'll super crop that branch, and allow the other branches to grow up. What do you typically do for... When, when some of those branches grow out of control and I'll grow the other branches. Well, typically what I do is I tend, I honestly, I keep up on my screen. I'm, I'm usually there and I, I'm working it every other day and I'm talking branches. So like, I don't normally have that many runoffs, but if I was to go away for say a while and I came home and it was, there was a lot of runoffs, I would like do the super crop technique. I, I'd like kind of pinch that branch, stunt it a little bit. If I was still in like, say, vegetation i would maybe top that branch low and then start tucking the the nodes that come off come off where i topped it i start tucking them again and start working them into my screen but yeah if i'm in if i'm in late flower and, and i have a runoff in late flower then i you just kind of just got to ride it out there's not much you can do in late flower because you're not going to super crop that branch because that could uh, stress the plant out too much you're not going to top it in late flower so 
that that's that's in my mind i'd be like oh i kind of messed up on this grog because i let it get away from me and i i've had that loss i've had plants that just they just keep on stretching and flower i'm like holy like it's just it's just crazy girl you know but for the most part i like to keep up on it another thing is in late flower you'll notice on your screens that sometimes the center of the screen is pushing up more so it looks like it looks more like higher on the canopy than everywhere else what i would do is go underneath my screen and I'll just tie a piece of string to the actual string of the frame. And I'll pull it down and I'll tie it to a weight as I look at my canopy. I'll pull it down so it's level again. And then I'll tie it a weight on and I'll hold it there. So I'll, because like once you use the screen like this, you can pull your screen down and your whole canopy will actually flex up and down as you pull on the screen. So I'll, I'll pull on my screen until it's perfectly level again, tie it off. And then I, now I'm maximizing my light again. Interesting. Yeah, the reason why I ask, I know you mentioned that you tuck for the first week of flower, and then after that, you're kind of letting the, the, the branches grow up. So, like, it was generally said that the plant stretches for 21 days after flipping the light cycle. Now, of course, that's going to depend on some factors, genetics, what light cycle you're actually on, and, and so on and so forth. But uh, that 14 days is what I was kind of mentioning is like, if you have branches growing out of control within that 14 days, what do you do? And, and you, you pretty much answered it there. So so at what point do you add a second layer of a trellis? You mentioned that you have your net set, so you can add in a second layer. When would you add in the second layer? What would the distance be between the first layer and the second layer? Yeah, so if, if I was the kind of scrogger that wanted to have a, a, like a double decker scrog, and there's a lot of a lot of growers out there that like to have that for sure, I would um what what they like to do is like they like to fill their for, their first screen full in veg. They keep on tucking until everything is completely full on that screen, and then they flip the flower once it's all full, and then they stop tucking. So that's what that's the difference that I don't do is. I always keep talking when I switch the flower. They don't keep talking. They now let their plant, their buds rise up or their colas, their branches start rising up. But at this time now, they're too like, from the, from the training that they've had, you're going to get a lot of skinnier branches. You're not going to get a lot of those thick, firm branches because you keep on tucking skinnier branches, right? So the ones that are coming up now off the screen are kind of flimsy. They're not as like strong and sturdy. So you're going to have to add a second trellis for support. So I would recommend it to be around like say six to eight inches off your second screen once you flip the flat, once you flip, because they're probably going to be around like say 12 inch colas altogether. So if you're sitting around eight inches, you're going to be supporting that pretty good. But I, I sometimes don't like doing that because if you don't have a lot of good air movement within that center canopy and you don't have a lot of good light penetration that's penetrating on those inner buds, then I just feel like sometimes it's a waste, and like you're not now you're not now you're not growing like nice pure colas off the screen. You're actually just growing branches with like with like buds, and then like a stick, and then a bud down here, and maybe a bud. But they, all the buds are getting less like quality as you go down. So there is pros and cons to everything, and, and everyone has their technique, and like I appreciate all of them really. I, it's just in my mind, I just I just I just don't see why. Why a lot of guys would like to or girls would like to do the double decker scrogs just just for the reason of like defoliating the center of it and keeping it clean for the airflow and and quality for the light to penetrate it stuff like that got it i've made the mistake of tucking for too long before i tuck for like the first 14 days and uh after that i didn't get much stretch and so like that was a that was a mistake because then everything's kind of flat and your buds are like mixed in within the net and it's like what the heck i did this wrong <laughs> so like yeah that seven day mark that you do is probably something i'm going to be doing in the future it seems like it's a sweet spot you know you don't get too much stretch to where it grows out of control and you need that second layer but you know you just got the 14 days of stretch and then um you know th those buds will hopefully be able to will be even across the canopy and be able to stay up on their own without that second layer Exactly. Like I aim for a six to eight inch colas off the top of the screen. So if you have an eight inch cola, it's going to support itself. That's not going to flop over. As long as you have fans in your space blowing them around, like not blowing them hardcore, but as long as you have air movement, always moving them and dancing your branches around, they're going to get, they're going to get strong. If you don't have air movement and they're just growing in a, in like a still environment and nothing's moving, they're going to get heavy and then they're going to fall. You need to build muscle and that's by moving wind, right? And another thing is, 
like you just said, when you, when you struggled and, and you talked for so long, what happens is, yeah, you're going to get a bunch of those little buds on there. But the way that I do it is that you'll see all the, all like the little branches coming up. Then you'll see, you'll notice the ones that are caught and you can snip them off. You can snip off certain nodes that you can tell aren't going to make it up to the strain. And so that, that's not like, that's another thing if you want to talk about defoliating. Like I get into defoliating and, and I snip off all those. That's what I actually was going to ask you next is, do you do any sort of defoliating? And adding into that would be having that net there, it can be difficult to kind of get underneath the net to water the plants or kind of hovering over the net. I know I mean, you can see your setup. You can actually have walk all the way around, but there's a lot of people in grow tents. And so do you have any tips on defoliating under and above the net and as well as watering and feeding underneath the net? Yeah, for sure. So <clears throat> what you can do is... If you're, if you're someone that is not good at bending down and getting underneath the screen and like just working in like on the ground, basically, you can build a platform straw, kind of like what I have behind me here. You can build it on like a table and build it to your height where you're comfortable to like, you can, you can like, you can build them as high as you want as long as you have a good ceiling distance, right? So you can build it almost to your high, high, high level. I've helped a lot of people in wheelchairs build straw frames and they can't stand up. So, so what, what they do is they build it to their eye level and they can just stand there and reach in and work on their plants just by sitting here and, and reaching in. Um, I use like a watering wand to water my plants nowadays. I just stick a little wand in there and I, I can just water them easily. But I used to use a little bucket, like a little, like a little, yeah, like a little um, jug, kind of like this jug right here, actually. A jug just like this and I would just water my plants just like that. Uh, so it takes time doing that. And, and now I don't have the time just to hand water like that. So I have a cool little water wand and they're a dime a dozen these days. You can find a water wand like at Canadian Tire or Home Depot or wherever, wherever your like local places, the shop, you can buy them everywhere now. Um, so yeah, for defoliating is like, I, like, I like to defoliate two major times. So one week before I flip my plants to flower, I will defoliate below my screen, everything below my screen. Um, all the leaves that are way tucked under there, they're gone. I'm stripping all my, all my stems are, are being stripped bare if they haven't made the top of this screen yet. And then after that, I wait a week before I flip the flower. So I do it one week before the flower, defoliate a lot of, a lot of stuff under my canopy. Then I wait a week, let them heal, let them heal from that defoliation because it does stress them out a little bit. Once they get back in their groove, I flip the flower. And on day 19, I do another major defoliation on day 19 of flower. I clean up everything below my screen one more time because it all comes back. So I'll do another major cleanup and that's my two defoliations. But during my second defoliation, I'll look up in my screen and you'll see nodes on the bottom of branches that you scrub that are trying to wrap around the branch to reach the light. But those ones just aren't going to quite make it. You're going to have to snip off a few of them because they're going to get they're going to get like, like I just said, they're going to get bigger right at your screen level, which you don't really want because they're not up exposed to the light. So there's going to be a lot of little node sites that you want to defoliate in your, uh, in your flower defoliation. Okay. So you're sacrificing some of those branches that aren't going to make it up and grow the six to eight inches above the net, which is kind of your ideal height. Yes. Now, are you doing any defoliation? Some people do it towards the end of flowering. They'll do one last one so light can get down and, and ripen the buds, for example. Are you doing anything around like day 45, I think, is a common day where people do a defoliation before harvest? Uh, nothing major, but I do remove fan leaves here and there. If there's a big fan leaf blocking a nice bud site, I will sometimes take that fan leaf off or... Sometimes I even like just take like a fingerling off a fan leaf. I won't remove the whole leaf. I'll just snip off like say the middle finger of that leaf. Because sometimes it's just a, just a leaf that's rubbing on a bud site or covering a bud site. And I'll take off just that little fingerling of it. Um, yeah, that's, that's something I do is I do walk around and, and remove fan leaves here and there. Tuck them under my screen. If I can tuck a fan leaf, I'll tuck it under my screen before I remove it. Uh, yeah, so there's always those little once in a while pluck a fan leaf here and there but nothing major i just did two major defoliations one week before and 19 days after i flip okay and i want to back up for a second because i thought of a question that should have been asked a little while ago which is positioning the plant underneath the net now you mentioned that you typically run four plants underneath the net but you also mentioned that when you're 
you're training, you're letting that plant grow up, right? And then you're doing that one bend towards the side. Are you positioning the plant directly underneath like the center of the net? I don't know how to explain this. Like, you know what I mean? Like, are, are you positioning towards more like towards the corner so that plant can grow outwards towards the center? Yeah, you're, you're, getting, you're getting close there. So I should have I should elaborated a bit more of, of when I taught my plants. I, I do taught my plants once. So okay. when, I, when, I do, right. when I do bend that main top over, eventually I'll get to that top, say, after I transplant it. A couple of weeks after I transplant it, I'll top that main stalk that's growing. I won't top that main, I won't top it to create two new tops because those tops, they're already there. They're, I'm not creating two new tops. They're just two nodes below that top, right? But now I'm going to, what I'm going to do now by topping is those two new nodes or nodes that are exposed are now going to grow and they're not going to be as firm and stiff as the top that I just topped off, right? Because that main stalk is always going to be thicker than the side branches that are coming off it. The main one is always going to be thick. So I top that main one just so I could have flexibility and work the two new branches into my scrog. So when you were when you said I, I top and, and direct that top somewhere, I don't do that because eventually that becomes two and they split off in their own direction. But what I do is I position my plants under my frame so they have enough space to come up and turn into a mushroom. And I try to keep it so they have enough space on every side of each other of, of like the plant. So against my frame here, it has to have enough space here as it does on this side of my frame beside this plant here. So I see that mistake a lot in my, in my Scroggers group, people positioning their plants on the side of their frame. So when the plant grows up, they have all this room to tuck over here, but now they're already running out of space here because they position their plant too far into the corner. So you definitely want to give your plants room to become like a mushroom. That's what you got a vision in your head is that plant becoming a mushroom in the end, it's a lot about like future visualize, visualization, really. Like when, you, when it comes to scrogging, you got to picture like what it's going to be in the end. And, and yeah, you got to think of a big mushroom happening. That's a good way to put it. Yeah, I never heard anybody say it like that, but it makes sense. And you can visualize once you say mushroom, you can certainly visualize how it'll be underneath yeah. the net, you know. Yeah. Now, harvesting. You already said one tip, which I think is fantastic, which is you cut the twine and then you basically just pull out the twine. And then are you just cutting from the base to harvest? Are you cutting individual branches? A lot of people get caught up because they're using nets and uh, things get intertwined, you know, and it's difficult to remove the branch because you got the net there. So um, backing up, do you have any like just general advice for harvesting? Yeah, the way I honestly harvest is I, what I said is like, yeah, I, I cut all the twine on just two sides of my frame. I pull it all out and then I, I do, I cut right from the base of my plant and then I cut individual branches from the main stalk of the branch. I'll just start cutting big branches off because I, I want, now I want to like open up my plant as much as possible. When I, when you scrog, they're always like kind of close together. You're still going to get air movement, but it's not like, it's real dense. I want to get air movement happening everywhere around these, around my buds now. So yeah, I cut them into like just nice big individual branches, hang them all inside a tent or inside a nice room. And I let them hang just, just like that individually. So I don't hang, I don't hang just big scrog plants. I definitely cut them up a little bit. How long do you dry for and what are your drying conditions, temperature and humidity? I like to keep my uh, temperature anywhere from like say 60 to 64 degrees Fahrenheit and anywhere from like say 60 to like or I should say like from 58 to 63 degrees or um, percent humidity so and I will I'll let them hang up in there as long as I keep those conditions in that environment they can sit there for as long as they want to because um, pretty much they, they're going to be curing themselves in those conditions after I like, like first I'll, okay, I should go back a little bit. Like when I do harvest, I take off the big fan leaves right away. So I'll break down into individual branches, take off those big, huge fan leaves that I don't want, but I'll leave like the little sugar leaves is what people call them, sugar leaves. I'll leave them on there. And then I hang all the branches. And then I, I go back about, I'll go back like say eight days, nine days later, and I'll do another dry trim, just trim off all my branches. And I'll, I'm usually... Like I have a nice environment that I dry in, so I'm not in a tent. I, I go right up into my space and I can sit there at a desk 
So I just keep on hanging them. And I let my, I let my plants cure in the environment that I hang them to dry in right after harvest. You letting them cure, so you're you're going through the dry period, but then they're just continuing it on through the cure. How, how long are they curing for? And when do you put them in containers? Yeah, so like I'll let I'll hang them. I'll let them hang up there for like I've had them hang up there for like over two months before. Like as long as it's dark and it's it's at the right conditions, I'll let them sit up there f- for as long as they want until I need that space, and then I'll jar them up. But particularly, what I want to do is I'll leave them in there. Like if I had to like if I had to like get going. I leave them in there for at least say 14 days hanging up there drying in the dark and then I would jar them and then I would burp them every single day for at least say probably half an hour and I would get the humidity packs to put in my jars at like probably like 60% humidity just to keep it safe in there. But yeah, like I always found that it works out just to keep them in my space that I keep nice and cold and and a nice humidity and they cure in there for me just like that. Okay, got it. Have you ever tried using those... uh grove bags yeah yeah i have used the grove bags before too uh I, I i do like them but i honestly like i do prefer the jar method if i was to pick a method i'd probably go back to the jar method i didn't do the grow bags quite 100 percent. you're supposed to do it you're supposed to like uh heat seal the top of the rim like of the bag and i didn't i didn't do that state that step so i can't really like give my opinion on them fully but um I, I did I did like them. I know that they, they probably did their job, but I might have left them in the bag too long. It's not something that you want to leave in there for a very extended long period of time. You want to let them kind of cure and then take them out of that bag and put them into like jars or something. That was my that was my experience. But like I said, I didn't heat seal the, the bag. So that might have messed it up. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, I actually just got the Grove bags. That's funny. I was I forget what video I was on. I think it was on the From the Stash podcast because I have another podcast and we, we talked about it and the comments were just flooded with people that are like, jars are outdated. This is 2022. Everyone used good Grove bags. And I was like, what the heck are these Grove bags? So I went out and bought some and uh, I just started using them. So I don't really have an opinion on them yet, but it, it sounds like a game changer. I mean, you, supposedly you you put your dried bud in there and then it, it cures itself. There's, there's no burping. You don't need to burp at all, apparently, and that uh, kind of cures in the bag. You don't even need to open up the bag or anything. So, um, yeah, I'm definitely going to have to try that out a little bit more. I'm using it as storage right now, and I want to see, particularly, I live in a very dry climate, and I want to see if it's uh, sucking out the humidity. Some people had said that they live in dry climates and their humidity, you know, their bud turns crumbles up over time. So I want to prevent, obviously prevent that from happening. But yeah, I just wanted to get your opinion on the, on the Grove bag since they seem to be a hot product here in 2022. Yeah, they are. Did, did you, uh, did you heat seal the top of your bag? No, I just, just sealed up the bag with the, and then put it into actually my wine fridge. I have it set to 60 degrees. And actually I did put a pack in there. I put some, uh, those humidity packs in some of them. And I put the I didn't put humid packs in other ones, so I'm gonna kind of see the difference on that as well. Yeah, well, I, I did. I actually talked to the Grove Bag, like the manufacturers, like right at the company themselves. I met I met some guy at, at some conference, and he told me that he highly recommends that you need to heat seal that top of those rims. It even says that like, you have to heat seal those for them to work the way that they are designed to, or else they will let that dry air into the bag. So you need to like, you need to heat, if you want to really do a, a proper test, you got to heat seal it. And what he said to me was, use your girlfriend's hair straightener and just go and just clamp it on the bag and just warm it up a little bit and it'll stay tight. I'm like, okay, man, like I'll try it my next round, but I'm not going to go do that now. <laughs> but yeah, he said, he, he said, you got to heat seal them or it's not going to do what you think it's going to do. Oh, man, I didn't know that. Yeah, so I was doing it wrong. <laughs> but uh, let's get back to the scrog. I do have like one more question, and then we can kind of wrap things up. Yield. A lot of people are trying to do the scrog technique specifically, specifically for yield purposes. Yeah. Have you ever measured yield when doing the scrog technique? Like, do you have like a yield per square foot or anything like that? Like, I used to measure yield when I was younger, when I was actually growing it for the reason of gaining like quantity. But um, ever since probably say like the last ten years, I don't even I don't even weigh my harvest anymore. But what I can say is like I used to always use a five by five screen, and I used to always grow four plants under it. And I typically would get say like eight ounces per plant on a two month veg. So I'd be like over a pound per 
pound per run on my five by five frame, I would always get over a pound per run out of four plants over a two month veg. So like the longer that you veg, the bigger your yield will be. But in my mind nowadays, the bigger your yield, the less your quality. Cause I just feel like the bigger the plant is and the bigger the buds are, the less quality is there. I always, now I find that my smaller plants are actually more potent and more powerful and more dense and they just smoke a lot better compared to my big, huge plants that yield like say 15 ounces per plant. Like, like, yeah, that's amazing. But look at like, it just doesn't smoke that nice. And it just feels like it just got like, just fed a lot. And like, it's just not as nice as my little plants that, that only veg for two months that, you know what I mean? Like that's just where I came to now. So, but with that being said, like you're definitely going to, probably yield a bit more scrogging than you would typically off a normal kind of plant, but only because you're going to be growing top dense colas on your screen and every bud you have is going to be a top cola that has density to it. Um, a lot of plants, a lot of ways that people grow is they'll have a lot of bud, but a lot of those lower buds are not going to be dense and they're not going to be that much quality to it because it's going to be fluffy bud. Uh, so yeah, I just find that with the way that I scrog, I have about 70 top colas per plant. That's the average 70 top colas. And they're all about like, say around six to eight inches tall and they're all dense. And, and yeah, I definitely yield a lot off, off one plant, but I, I don't measure it anymore. I'm not, I'm not there to do that. I'm there just to, just to enjoy it myself and my family. Really. I agree that there's definitely a balance between yield and quality and if we pack up for a second quality is so subjective right quality to me can be different to you to the next grower to the next grower so some people might think that non-dense buds are quality that could be quality to them right the airier stuff that might be quality to them and they might say the dense stuff isn't good quality, you know? So <laughs> it's really, really subjective is what I found because in the comment section, it's just people debate about it all day long on what's quality and what's not quality. And it's just, it's funny. <laughs> yeah, like, like some people love flowers that foxtail with like so much foxtails on them. They love that. They see the trichome production on the foxtail, but like I wouldn't like, I don't like foxtails so much. I like a nice indica density flower compared to like a sativa foxtailing plant. So like, yeah, you're right. Like everyone has their own preference, even in styles that they grow. Um, everyone, everyone has preferences in every way they do things in life. So, and they all work really. Everything works as long as it works for you. Absolutely. And just like today, talking about the scrog technique, I mean, this is just one way to go about it. It's your style of doing it. There could be a whole bunch of other people that do it differently than the way you do it. And there's not really a right or wrong, right? There's just, it's a different way to do it. And that actually brings up a question for the folks tuning into this. Do you do the scrog technique? Let me know in the comments. How do you do it? Do you do it the same way that Troy does it? Or do you do it differently? I'd love to hear your techniques down in the comment section below. Is there any other things about the scrog technique that we missed? Or do you have any general advice for new gardeners? Um, well, for yeah, for new gardeners, one thing that I always try to tell every one of them is don't overwater your seedlings. Like when you first start growing, that's one of the main things that people mess up on is just overwatering their plants. Plants don't need to be overwatered. They need oxygen. So the, your little plants, let those pots dry up before you add more water to them. That's, that's a that's a really important step for a new grower because I've that's what I stumbled upon when I first started a long time ago and everyone I teach, they stumble upon that as well. They drown their plants, basically. They need oxygen. And uh, and for the scrog technique, the only thing that I can advise people with, if you want to try this out is to build your frames on a platform or even on the ground if you're comfortable. But you need to build it to make yourself have accessibility around it and able to work on your frame. So if you're if you're in a if you're in a four by four tent and it only has one door in that tent, you might not want to scrog the way I do because you're going to need to get to the side of it and you might need to get behind it. A lot of tents have two doors, so that works. Or you can buy tents like I have. I have tents that have like it has one main door and then two side doors that come to, that flap down. So you can work on each sides or the front. You need to be able to access at least three sides of your scrog. That's that's important for uh, anyone who wants to get into this. And you want to make your screen size comfortable for you to work on with your hands and water. Good tips. 
so wrapping things up, how can the listeners find you and what do you have upcoming in the future? Well, right now I, I have a, I have something really exciting happening. Actually, I, uh, I started something called Scrog School happening. So that's on YouTube, on my YouTube channel. I have a, a little series that I, it's going to call be called Scrog School. I've already done two episodes of it. And right now it's going to start getting in the interesting times because I'll be transplanting coming up now and start doing the training. So every Thursday at 7 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time, I go live in this room. And I have cameras positioned everywhere in this room, uh, like high-definition cameras. And we just sit here and we, like, teach how to, how to scrog. I teach you. I show you how to do it with my hands. Uh, so, yeah, that's Scrog School. Um, the Insta- or my uh, Facebook page called Scroggers. You can find me there. There's a lot of good Scroggers on that page. If you're interested in scrogging, just go over to Facebook, type in Scroggers. A group will come up. We have 65,000 members in there, and, uh, and they all love it. They're all... We like post scrogs every day, all day. So yeah, that, that's, that's my two major spots. Instagram, I'm like the Northern Scrogger on there. If you want to see my pictures of scrogs, I'm all about scrogs. So yeah, I eat, breathe and sleep scrog. <laughs> definitely sounds like you have some exciting things upcoming in the future. I'll definitely have a link to your YouTube channel down in the YouTube description section below on this video. And then if you're tuning on one of the podcast platforms, just search for them. You'll find them. If you enjoyed this episode, click that thumbs up button. Also, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Every single weekend, I release a new Garden Talk podcast episode, and I would love for you to tune into future episodes. Troy, thanks so much for coming on. This has been uh, a cool talk. I appreciate you revealing your techniques <laughs> to the audience, and uh, I hope uh, some people tuning in here will uh, head on over to your channel and subscribe to you and, and start watching your content because you have some really, really good content over there. Chris, thank you so much. I really appreciate you doing this for me. and. Um and yeah, like just thank you so much and everyone for watching. Like I appreciate you watching us and, and yeah, I hope you enjoy the scrog technique and keep watching this guy, man, because he is definitely gonna teach you the ways of life and the ways of growing and, and I appreciate you, Chris. Thank you so much, man. Thank you too. All right, peace out everyone. Catch you in the next episode.